Mr. Majeski's Anatomy 32 class lecture, chapter 18, part 2, the cerebrum. So the cerebrum is the big wrinkly part of the brain that we all think of when we think of the brain. And it turns out that it has some interesting features. For instance, the two hemispheres of the cerebrum are separated by a very deep longitudinal fissure, as you can see clearly here. And at the very end of that fissure is what's called the corpus callosum, which is the structure that actually connects the right and left hemispheres of the brain. Now, the outside of the cerebrum is called the cerebral cortex, and it is composed of gray matter, so where uh, cell bodies are and synapsising is occurring. And these are rolls and folds that are all piled up on themselves, so that you end up with the folds, or the uh, gyri, uh, gyri, and the fissures or sulci, which are the grooves between the gyri. So I like to think of the gyri as heels and the fissures and sulci as valleys, up and down. So there are five lobes to the cerebrum. Four of these lobes you can uh, see on the outside of the cerebrum. You've got the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. And then the fifth lobe is called the insula. And if you go cut away at the temporal lobe at about the lateral fissure or lab lateral sulcus, as you can see right here, then you can get to the uh, insula. Turns out there's also an important structure that's a little harder to see that's referred to as the central sulcus that helps separate the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. So here in this picture down here, you see at the this is where the central sulcus would be, with the parietal lobe shown in blue and the frontal lobe shown in gray. And the gyrus that runs along in front or anterior to the central sulcus is referred to as the precentral gyrus. And it is where you have the primary motor areas of the cortex. And then the gyrus that runs uh, directly posterior to the central sulcus is the postcentral gyrus, and this is where you have your primary somatosensory area of the cortex. So other structures. Well, the cerebrum has a lot of white matter, obviously, and the white matter is composed of axons that are communicating both with different parts of the brain and with the rest of the body. So you have what are called various kinds of tracks. So you have the associated tracks, these conduct nerve impulses between the gyri of the same hemisphere. So it goes from one gyri in the left hemisphere to another gyri in the left hemisphere, etc. Then you have the commissural tracts. These conduct nerve impulses between the gyri of one hemisphere with the corresponding gyri on the other hemisphere. So from left to right and vice versa. And then there's the projection tracts, which are the ones that leave the cerebrum and is going to send out the signal or receive the signal from other parts of the central nervous system or um, from the central nervous system back to the cerebrum. There's some other important structures found within the cerebrum, such as the basal nuclei. These are three per hemisphere uh, gray matter that are found actually within the white matter deeper in the tissue of the cerebrum. And collectively known as the basal nuclei, if you, however, they each have their own name. You have the uh, caudate, which is sort of this curl, maybe sort of like a tadpole shape that runs uh, directly lateral to the lateral ventricles. And then you have the putnam, which is below that. And then there's also the uh, globus pallidus, which is actually um, deeper to the putnam, so you can't see it from this lateral view. You have to get a cross-section to get a good view of it. And their important jobs is to help regulate uh, movement and cognitive processes, especially the initiation and termination of movement. So if there are damage to the basal nuclei, you can have various disorders. For instance, Parkinson's disease is specifically the generation of dopamine-releasing neurons that enter the basal nuclei. And the consequence of this is uncontrolled shaking and muscle rigidity. There's Huntington's disease, where the patient will have rapid, jerky, involuntary movements, and some, also some mental deterioration. And this is caused by the generation of the caudate nucleus and the putamen over time. 
Uh, there's Tourette syndrome, which is the involuntary body movements and verbal outbursts. Not necessarily profanity, but just inappropriate sounds. Uh, and also dysfunction of cognitive neural circuits. There's schizophrenia, where a person has delusions, distortion of reality, paranoia, hallucinations. Again, dysfunction of neural behavioral uh, circuits. And then there's the obsessive compulsive disorder, which is where someone is trapped in repetitive thoughts and movements that lead to repetitive acts. And again, dysfunction of behavioral neural circuits in the basal nuclei. So very, very important structure that has been linked to many, many uh, disorders. Next, we talk about the limbic system. The limbic system is considered the emotional brain, the place where you can find pain, pleasure, docility, affection, anger. Um, and it's basically made up of tissue in the inferior portion of the cerebrum and the superior portion of the diencephalon. And it's also closely linked to smell and memory. Because again, you know, you have smell something that can bring back memories of something else, like your grandma cooking bread when you smell bread cooking. Uh, so basically, as you can see here, you can see the limbic system goes around the corpus callosum. It goes into the diencephalon. And basically, it includes a lot of different structures, including the hippocampus, which has been linked to memory, uh, the hypothalamus, uh, which we all have heard about before, which is linked to rage, the amygdala, which is linked to rage and, and docility, and the olfactory bulb, which is part of our sense of smell. So, the cerebral cortex, as we mentioned before, has two main functions, receiving sensory information and then sending out motor uh, messages. And the way this is basically done is, again, we're talking about that central sulcus between the parietal and frontal lobes. And the area that's posterior to that is the part of the brain that tends to be receiving sensory information. And so this will include things like the primary visual area at the very back of the head, uh, the gustatory area and the primary auditory area, sort of on the lateral side of the brain, the primary olfactory area, which is within the lateral sulcus, and the primary somatosensory area, which is that uh, post-central uh, gyrus uh, gyri. And that's where you get a lot of your information on what's happening with the bulk of your body. So if you take a closer look at the primary somatosensory area, you see that it's getting the touch sensations, pain, tickle, itch, those sort of things from throughout the body. And areas where we have more sensory neurons and more sensory receptors end up taking up a larger portion of the primary somatosensory gyri. As you can see here, we have a lot of signals coming from our lips and our face and not so much from, say, our elbow. Then, the sensory information, after it's been received, is then integrated and made sense of in the secondary sensory areas. So, near the primary visual area, you have the visual associated area, which is used to help us actually recognize, oh, here it is right here, help us recognize what we're seeing. Uh, and then the primary auditory area has the auditory uh, associated area, which helps us dis distinguish between sounds, and then the prime Mary somatosensory area has the somatosensory associated area, which is where we often find memories linked to particular senses are located, and also ways to distinguish between different kinds of touch, say something rough versus something soft. Now, everything in front of or anterior to the central sulcus has where we get the processing, the thinking, and also the decisions that send out the signals for movement. So th these are often referred to as motor areas. So we have the pre-central gyrus, where we have the primary motor area. And this is going to send out information about what we want our body to do. And much like the um, primary somatomotor sensory area back here, the somatosensory map, you have an equivalent of a primary motor area map. Again, areas of the body that have a lot of nerves running to it for moving muscles have a larger portion of the primary motor area. So again, our face, lots of muscles, lots of movement, while our elbow, not so much. And then in front of that is the premotor area where you get learned motor activities. For instance, learning how to do a layup so that it's just natural. 
is uh, that sort of learning is found in the premotor area. Other important areas in the motor area, you have uh, Broca's speech area that integrates and sends information to the premotor area to control muscles for speech and also for helping to control breathing. You've got the uh, Wernick area over here that helps to interpret the meaning of speech by recognizing what the spoken words are. You have the common integrative area that helps integrate all the sensory, sensory information so that we can actually form thoughts based on the information we're receiving. And then the prefrontal cortex, which I would say is the you of the brain. It's where personality and intellect is. It's where we do all of our reasoning, planning for future events, development of abstract ideas. It's very, very important. Now, moving on, we see that uh, there is what's referred to as hemispheric lateralization, which means that our right side of our brain controls the left side of the body. The left side of the brain controls the right side of, of the body. But also, it means that the right hemisphere has certain preferences on what kind of uh, functions it's, it's regulating, and the left hemisphere has its own preferences. It's not a 100% to 0%. It's more like a 75 to 25 or 60 to 40. So, for instance, the right side has been linked to musical awareness, spatial and pattern recognition, emotion, generating emotional content of language, identifying and discriminating among odors. The left hemisphere has been linked to reasoning, numeric and scientific skills, uh, spoken and written language skills. Again, it's not absolutely one or the other for the right and left hemisphere, but there's a bias toward one hemisphere versus the other. Alzheimer's disease is disabling senile dementia, uh, where a person loses the ability to reason and care for themselves, and this is a progressive degenerative disease. Um, there are three main uh, structural abnormalities found in a brain of someone with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there is a loss of neurons that liberate acetylcholine, especially in the basal nuclei. You can see how this neuron loss looks between a healthy brain and an Alzheimer's brain. Uh, there's beta, beta amyloid plaques that develop outside of neurons, and these are just clusters of abnormal proteins. And then there's neurofibril tangles found inside the neurons, where their filaments are getting all bundled up abnormally rather than smoothly forming the structure of the neuron and sending uh, materials around the cell properly. Other disorders can be a concussion, which is often leads to a temporary loss of consciousness. Usually, if you just have one or two in your life, there's no obvious problems, but if you get too many, it can lead to long-term difficulty. Contusion is much more serious because uh, the brain is actually bruised. So there's leakage of blood into the brain, and you may even have the pia mater torn. So this could lead to long-term consequences. Then the laceration, which basically means the brain is torn. This could be from a skull fracture, a gunshot wound, whatever. You get a lot of bleeding in the brain, plus obvious physical damage. And that can lead to long-term consequences. There's aphasia, which is the inability to comprehend words. Uh, often, this is uh, linked to damaging to particular parts of the brain. For instance, non-fluent aphasia means you can't properly form words. And this is damage to the Broca's speech area. While fluent aphasia means you have trouble understanding spoken or wicked, written words. And this would be damage to the Wernick's area. And then there's epilepsy, which is characterized by short, reoccurring seizures that involve the motor, the sensory, and also psychological um, malfunctions, such as talking, babbling incoherently for a short period of time, or falling down and going through the massive shaking, which is what we usually think of when we think of epilepsy. And that's it for this part of the lecture. I hope you enjoyed it.